Hey everybody, welcome to tutorial 17. In this video, we're going to use what we developed in the previous two tutorials and put together an environment in which we can perform and modify a simple musical composition. For your convenience, I've included a link in the video description below where you can download the code that we'll develop in this video to save you the trouble of having to type it all out yourself. One of our main concerns in building this performance environment will be to avoid scattered chunks of code that need to be evaluated individually and instead group all the components together so that the entire setup process can be invoked with a single keystroke. With this type of approach, as you can probably guess, the order in which we do things is going to be very important because there are certain things that need to happen before other things. For example, we can't read a sound file into a buffer unless we've booted the server first, and we can't create a synth unless we've first added the corresponding synthdef, and so on. Let's begin with an overview of what the structure of this code might look like. What I like to do is first configure the audio server and then initialize any simple global variables that we're going to use and then define several piece specific functions which handle things like reading sound files into buffers, allocating audio buses, etc. And after that I register these functions with server boot, server quit, and server tree classes which control precisely when these functions get evaluated. After doing that, we boot the server, and once the server is booted, we evaluate any remaining code that requires a booted server and hasn't already been handled by steps one through four. So that's the overview. Let's get into the details. On the desktop, I've got the project folder from tutorial 16. Inside this folder, the code we developed in the last two videos, which includes our three synth defs, two p-binds from tutorial 15, a line of code that allocates an audio bus for our reverb synth, and the code for reading multiple folders of sound files into a dictionary of buffers. The folder of sound files is mostly the same. The only difference is I've added a few more sound files to the shakers folder. So what I'm going to do is start with this very basic unstructured code and sort of build around it so that it eventually resembles this structural overview which I'll copy and paste into our basic code. The first step is configuring the audio server. Even though the local server is automatically stored in the global variable s when we start SuperCollider, it's not really a bad idea to do it yourself, just to make sure. Uh, and then we want to configure the server using the server options class. And we saw a little bit of this in tutorial 7. Here we're talking about things like setting the sampling rate, the audio hardware device, the number of hardware output buses, just basically anything that requires a server reboot in order to take effect. Uh, we'll start by setting the output device with s.options.outdevice. And we can see the available devices by evaluating serveroptions.devices. And what you can do after evaluating this line is just copy and paste the desired device from the post window into your code, making sure to enclose it in uh, quotation marks. So with this choice, I'd be using my computer's built-in audio output. But maybe in some cases I might want to use my Motu interface. Uh, and in fact, because I'm making a tutorial video, I actually want to use Soundflower to route audio from SuperCollider to my recording software. So if you envision yourself using different devices in different situations, what you can do is copy all of them onto multiple lines, like this, and then just comment out the ones you're not going to use. So if we boot the server now, we can see that SuperCollider is using Soundflower as its output device. Next, let's set the number of hardware output buses. And since we're using Soundflower, we should specify two output buses because uh, this version of Soundflower has two available outputs. It actually says two channels right here in the device name itself. So we type s.options.num output bus channels and set that value equal to two. Now, if we were using the Motu, instead, and I'll just temporarily uncomment it, uh, evaluate, quit, and reboot the server. And now we can see that the Motu is the output device. And we can also see that the Motu has more than two output channels. In fact, it has 14. Now I'm familiar enough with this Motu to know that these first two channels correspond to the Motu's two main analog outputs. Then we have another eight analog outputs, followed by two digital SPDIF outputs, and a stereo headphones output. In a performance, we almost certainly wouldn't be using all of these outputs simultaneously, but it's a good idea to set 
num output bus channels equal to the total number of device outputs so that the local host server is consistent with the hardware. And this way, all 14 outputs are available regardless of which outputs we actually end up using. If we evaluate this and then quit and reboot the server and then open the level meters, we see a total of 14 hardware output channels. And this means if I choose, I could send sound to the first analog output corresponding with output bus zero or the first digital output, which corresponds with output bus 10. Essentially, you want to make sure you know how many outputs your device has and make sure you give the local host server that many output bus channels. So now let's go back to our two channel Soundflower setup. If your piece involves microphones or some other audio input, you'd want to add s.options.inDevice and choose the correct name for the hardware device you're using for input, which may or may not be the same as the hardware output device. And you also want to set the correct number of input bus channels, just like we did with the output buses. The composition we're going to make in this video won't have any live audio input, so this code here doesn't really actually matter, but I'll leave it here for posterity and make it look sort of reasonable. In the macOS audio MIDI setup utility, we can examine Soundflower 2 channel, which we're using for output, and we can see that it's currently set to a sample rate of 44,100. And so we want SuperGlider to be running at that rate also. So we can do that with s.options.sampleRate. And one last thing I like to do is set the amount of real-time memory that the server is allowed to access. s.options.memsize tells us that the default is 8,192 kilobytes. One of the more common situations where real-time memory comes into play is when using delay lines that allocate memory on the fly, instead of relying on explicitly allocated buffers. This includes UGENs like delay n and comb n, etc. So for example, using the default mem size, let's create a UGEN function that delays pink noise by one second. No problem. Even 10 copies of this function is doable with the current mem size. But if we try something to the tune of 50 one second delays, the server slams us with memory allocation messages. If you ever see this behavior in the post window, it means you're asking the server to allocate more real time memory than the amount of memory it's actually allowed to allocate. Now, I'm, I might not be 100% accurate with the details of the math, but here's the basic concept. Uh, with a one second delay, we need enough memory to store 44,100 samples. So a good question is, how many kilobytes is 44,100 samples? Well, uh, SuperCollider outputs audio in 32-bit float format by default, and there are eight bits in one byte. Uh, so if 32 bits are being used for one sample, then one sample is equal to four bytes, or 32 divided by eight. So one second of audio is 176,400 bytes. Divide by 1,000, and we've got 176.4 kilobytes. So our first example, with a single one second delay, needs approximately this many kilobytes of real-time memory. And this is totally fine with the default mem size of 8192. With 10 delay lines, we're still fine, uh, but a 50 second delay, that's greater than 8192, and that's when we start to run into problems. So the solution here is to set a higher mem size before booting the server. I've gotten into the habit of specifying a value of two to the power of 20. And I don't think this value even needs to be a power of two. But anyway, this is roughly a gigabyte of real-time memory. And it's probably extremely generous, even if you're using a lot of delay lines. In most cases, you probably won't be using anywhere near this volume of memory. But for what it's worth, I've never run into any problems when using this value. And it's just uh, one of the many super collider habits that I've gotten into over the years. You can read the server options help file to see uh, other server configurations that are possible. but for now, I'm going to call this section done and move on to the next section of initializing global variables. This section is pretty open-ended, and this is where I'll stash declarations of values that I just want to be able to access anywhere else in the code. So this might be things like um, 
an integer corresponding to some initial index into a collection, arrays containing pitch values or amplitude values, really just anything that makes sense to keep track of in the context of your composition. And right now there's only one global variable in particular that I'd like to include, and that's an integer index corresponding to the lowest numbered hardware output bus that we'd like to use. In many cases, and in many of the previous tutorials, zero has been our lowest numbered hardware output bus, and we've been hard coding this value in, for example, into ugen functions that look something like this, or a synth.new statement that looks like this. And what's happened to me a few times is that I'll then find myself at some electroacoustic concert or festival where I transfer my supercollider code to a different computer, but then this new computer is sending audio to hardware outputs that don't correspond with index zero. Uh, like, for example, we saw a bit earlier that my Motu interface has 10 analog outputs with indices 0 through 9, and then above that, two digital outputs at indices 10 and 11. And if you find yourself in this situation, you might have to comb through your entire code and replace all these zeros with some other number, and unfortunately, you can't just do a massive find and replace operation because the zero character usually appears, like, everywhere. So this becomes a really stupid and tedious chore. So by creating a global variable for the lowest output bus index, you can then use that variable in the rest of your performance code, like this. And so uh, then if you end up in a situation where, oh, for whatever reason, we're using the digital outputs and those begin at index 10, you only have to change this one line of code at the top of your file. And then this change automatically propagates throughout the rest of your code, which is very convenient. If later on we find the need for more global variables, we'll revisit this section. But for now, this is all I want to add. So we'll move on to the next section in which we're going to define several language side functions, each of which contains some code designed to handle one specific aspect of the composition. So let's start with a function for reading sound files into buffers, since we already have that code from the last video. So let's go and grab that code and paste it up here. And all we're going to do is enclose it in curly braces to create a function and give it a global variable name, make buffers. Notice that when we evaluate this clump, we're only defining the function and not actually evaluating its contents. We can verify this by evaluating b, which is still nil and not a dictionary yet. In section four of our performance environment, we're going to use server boot, server tree, and server quit to schedule the evaluation of this function and other ones like it. So let's actually start doing that right now. Functions registered with server boot will be evaluated immediately after the server boots. Functions registered with server quit will be evaluated automatically when the server quits. And functions registered with server tree will be evaluated whenever the node tree is reinitialized, which is triggered by things like uh, s.freeall or just hitting command period. So the first question we want to ask ourselves is, when do we want this function, make buffers, to be evaluated? Well, we don't want this to happen after the server quits because that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and there's no need to do this every time the node tree is reset because command period doesn't have any effect on allocated buffers. So server boot is probably the best choice here. To register this function with server boot, we simply type server boot dot add and then provide the name of our function. In the last video, I mentioned that this make buffers code is pretty robust. Uh, you can go into your sound file library and add or remove sound files or subfolders, and, and this code will still work. Uh, in fact, let's just take a moment to make sure it works now. So we'll boot the server, and because we've registered this function, it should be automatically evaluated for us. And sure enough, uh, B, if we evaluate it, uh, we see it's now a dictionary. And so we should be able to play any of the sound files stored within. Good. So let's free all the buffers and quit the server. And now let's imagine a situation where you take this main project folder and, for example, move it to somebody else's computer. Or another example, let's actually move this folder to a new location on my computer. So first, let's save this SCD file. And then I'm going to go into Applications and the Super Collider folder. 
and move the project folder in here. Then we'll close this code file and open the version of this SuperCollider file, which is in this new location. Now, well, this path name here is inaccurate. This is no longer the location where our sound files are stored. So if we do the same process as before and boot the server, B is a dictionary, but it's empty and our sound files haven't been properly loaded. And so if we try to play one of them, we get an error message. Here's one way you can avoid this problem. In the SuperCollider language, most of the time, if you type a word starting with a lowercase letter, SuperCollider decides it's a local variable that needs to be declared before it can be used. Like if I just type some word starting with a lowercase letter, SuperCollider complains like we'd expect it to. But there's a handful of special cases in which we can use a lowercase word that doesn't require declaration. Two somewhat common examples are the booleans true and false. And one less common example is called this process, lowercase t, uppercase p. This process is an instance of a class called main, which, you know what, we're not going to worry about this too much because we're getting dangerously close to the nuclear core of SuperCollider. Main is one of those classes that's probably really critical to the deep essential functionality of SuperCollider, but it doesn't have anything to do with musical functionality. Probably the best I can do is say that uh, basically this process provides a way for the SuperCollider environment to refer to itself. And there's a method for this process called now executing path, which returns a string representing the path to the code file that you are currently editing, uh, assuming you've saved that file at least once. So using this current scd file, this process dot now executing path returns a path through uh, applications slash supercollider, etc., where I just moved this folder. So hopefully you can see where I'm going with this. We are going to modify the path name at the top of our make buffers code, uh, incorporating this process dot now executing path so that it always works no matter where we put the main project folder. But first, I'm going to save and close this scd file and, and move this folder back to the desktop because that's where I want it to be and I don't want things to get more confusing than they need to be. So here is our original version uh, from the desktop. Okay, so this process dot now executing path gives the path to this current code file, but we want the path to the folder called buffers, which is in the same parent folder. So let's create an instance of path name from this process dot now executing path, and then ask that path name for its parent path. And this gives us a string representing the path to the parent folder. And so now we can just use the plus plus concatenation operator to append the string buffers backslash. And what we'll do is create another global variable in section two called tilde path and set it equal to this line of code and then replace our hard coded path with this new variable. Redefine our new make buffers function, uh, register it with server boot and reboot the server. And our dictionary is once again properly filled with buffers. And you can take my word for it or try it out yourself that this code uh, using a dynamically generated path name will properly load your sound files no matter where your project folder happens to be. Okay, so next function. Since we've got a reverb synth def, that means we'll be passing audio between synths. And that means we should allocate an audio bus. So we'll make a function called make buses to handle this task. Uh, and instead of just copying our existing bus.audio code into this function as is, what I'm actually going to do here is create another dictionary. Call it tilde bus. Add to the dictionary a stereo audio bus stored at the symbol reverb. And if we need more buses for any reason, we can always come back and just add another line below, just like this. Uh, we now want to register this function. So uh, should we choose server boot or server tree? And here, registering with server tree would actually be a mistake, I think, because if we did, that means every time we hit command period or reinitialize the node tree, SuperCollider will reevaluate this function and would therefore allocate another stereo bus. And watch what happens if we manually reevaluate these two lines several times in a row. 
the size of the dictionary doesn't increase, but Super Collider remembers the index of the last allocated bus and moves up to the next available index when we ask for another. And there's a limit here, actually, determined by s.options.num audio bus channels. And if we hit that limit, we will get an error message. So I'm going to register this function with server boot. And this is probably a good time as any to uh, create some sort of cleanup function, which gets evaluated whenever we quit the server to basically just tie up any loose ends. For example, we'd probably want this cleanup function to deallocate any buses. Uh, so we'll make a function called cleanup and inside to reset the server's bus index counter, we use s.newBusAllocators. And we could also use this function to unregister all the functions that we've registered with uh, server boot, server tree, and server quit using the remove all message. And then we register this cleanup function with server quit. And you know, it's probably a good idea to include this cleanup code with our server configurations in section one, just to be extra safe. Okay, next function. As we saw towards the end of the previous video, we don't want to have to manually reinstantiate a reverb synth or any other effect synths for that matter every time we hit command period because that's annoying and tedious. Uh, but any function registered with server tree is automatically evaluated whenever we hit command period or otherwise free all the nodes from the server. So server tree is really a perfect fix for this problem. So let's make a function called make nodes, which will eventually be registered with server tree. And this function will be responsible for creating an initial desired configuration of groups and synths on the server. So we'll make two groups. Uh, one will be the so-called main group at the head of the node tree, uh, which will be the target for any synths that just generate signal. And the other group will be specifically for the reverb synth, making sure that the reverb group is placed after the main group. And then we want an instance of the reverb synth to be created for us. Uh, I'll put some specific argument values in here in case we ever want to change them later. And here's a moment where you can actually use some of the code we've created earlier in this video. Specifically, the reverb synth will read signal from the reverb bus that we've allocated in our bus dictionary. And the reverb synth will output to the bus index specified by our global variable out. And of course, we want to make sure that this reverb synth's target is our newly created reverb group. The last thing I'm going to do with this function, which I guess is sort of a finesse and probably not absolutely necessary, is wrap the contents of this function in s.bind. s.bind takes a function containing server commands and groups them together as one bundle of OSC messages, making sure they get executed by the server at exactly the same time. And this is basically just a guarantee that we don't accidentally try to add the reverb synth before creating the reverb group, because in that case, we'd get a node not found message. And like I said, I'm probably being fancier than is actually necessary. If you take away s.bind, it'll probably still work, but there's no disadvantage to using s.bind. Now, I'm going to delay registering this make nodes function with server tree because we haven't yet dealt with adding our synth devs. And of course, that needs to happen before we can make any synths. We'll get there. So one last function to define, and this one will be responsible for creating the actual musical events that constitute a performance of the piece. And rather than slog our way through what will probably be a fairly substantial function, uh, I want to just code a very basic skeleton placeholder sort of thing, and then come back to it later in the video. In this function, we're going to make a new dictionary and give it a nice short name, just the global variable E, short for events. And we're going to add to this dictionary some number of musical event functions. So E at event 1 will point to some function. Uh, e at event 2 will point to another function, and so on. These functions will eventually contain things like synth.new, pbind.play, and other bits of code that uh, generate or manipulate sound. But for now, when we evaluate one of these functions, we're just going to print the name of the event in the post window. It's often desirable to use some sort of 
physical controller other than the computer to trigger these musical events. And this make events function is a perfectly reasonable place to connect available MIDI devices. And uh, we'll also add a MIDI def that responds to continuous controller messages. Uh, again, having it do nothing for the time being, and we'll come back to it later. I'm going to register this function with server tree, but like we did with make notes, I'm going to actually delay registering this function as well, uh, mostly to help make sure that uh, this make events function doesn't uh, inadvertently get evaluated twice or something like that. And with that, sections three and four of our performance environment are basically done, uh, ignoring the fact that we don't actually have any musical events yet. But let's move on to section five, where we finally actually boot the audio server. But we can't just do s.boot and then immediately continue with things like synth devs and whatever. Uh, what we need to do is tell the server to boot, which usually takes a second or two, and then wait until booting is complete before continuing. And we can do that using s.waitforboot. We provide a function, and wait for boot boots the server, and when booting is complete, then, and only then, evaluates the function we've given it. And keep in mind, once the server is booted, this will trigger the functions make buses and make buffers because they've been registered with server boot. And uh, make buses doesn't actually ask the server to do anything. That's all language side. But make buffers definitely asks the server to do something because reading sound files into buffers is a server side job. And depending on how many sound files you have, this is going to take a little bit of time. So it's probably a good idea to start this wait for boot function with s.sync. Uh, s.sync says to the server, hey, whatever you're doing, finish it up, but let me know when you're done. And when the server is finished doing whatever it's been doing, reading sound files or whatever, it says to the language, okay, I'm done. And that's the interpreter's cue to continue with whatever comes after s.sync. So here, uh, after s.sync, is where I like to add my synth devs. So uh, I'm going to go grab those and cut and paste them in here. And at this point, I would like to do a sidebar about s.sync um, and a few related topics, because at first glance, it probably looks like s.sync is really straightforward and convenient. And it is, but uh, there are actually a few rules and concepts behind s.sync that I want to make perfectly clear. So uh, the following will be an example where s.sync is useful that also shows how to implement it properly and how to avoid some potential error messages. As part of the design of Super Collider being split into language side and server side, there's a distinction made between two types of server execution called synchronous and asynchronous execution. And there's a guide file called synchronous and asynchronous execution, which offers some good insight into this issue. Some server actions are synchronous. And one of the simplest examples is reading samples that have been stored in a buffer, like using playbuff, for example. Synchronous actions are usually locked to the sampling rate and are given top priority, because if these things don't get top priority, then we risk sample dropouts that create clicks and pops and glitches and just garbage audio. And then there are asynchronous commands, which aren't locked to the sampling rate, including things like synthdef.add, buffer.read. Asynchronous commands require some amount of time to finish. And this amount of time can vary depending on whatever else the server is currently doing. So we don't actually know exactly how long an asynchronous command will take. But the reality is that we need certain things, usually asynchronous commands, to completely finish before certain synchronous commands can be executed. For example, a synthdef needs to be added and fully loaded into memory before we can instantiate corresponding synth. And similarly, we usually want to finish storing a sound file in a buffer before we start playing that buffer with uGens. So in the following example, I'm creating and adding a synth def that takes 50 sine waves with random frequencies, sums them together, and then applies a simple amplitude envelope. And what we'd like to do here is run one large chunk of code that adds the synth def and immediately creates a new synth from that synth def. If we then evaluate these two commands together with one keystroke, 
it doesn't work. As you can see, we get a synthdef not found message. And this is because the language tells the server, hey, add this synthdef. And then almost instantaneously, the language says to the server, hey, make a synth. But the server says, hey, that synthdef doesn't exist because the server had not finished that particular asynchronous command. But it's not like the server abandoned the synthdef command. It just needed maybe a few more milliseconds to finish it. Uh, and notice that if we evaluate only the synth command, it does actually work. What we need to do is just wait a little bit of time after adding the synth def before playing the synth. So let's incorporate a one second wait time using one dot wait. And also to make this demonstration work correctly, we need to add a synth def that doesn't already exist on the server. So to make sure that happens, I'm just going to keep changing the name of this synth def before each evaluation. This doesn't work either. And we get this wacky error message that says yield was called outside of a routine. And this is probably one of the more confusing error messages for new users because neither routine nor yield appears in our code. So what's really the problem here? Uh, well, it's probably worth talking about routines. Basically, a routine is a function that can pause in the middle of execution and then wait for something to happen before continuing, such as uh, waiting for another task to be completed or waiting for a certain amount of time to elapse. Uh, here's a really simple example. Let's say we want to post foo, wait two seconds, and then post bar. This is not allowed, and we get the same error. Uh, if we evaluate multiple code statements, we are not allowed to pause in between unless we're inside a pausable process, and routine is one such process. So fixing this problem is as simple as just enclosing this code in a routine and playing it. So watch the post window here. So that works, and uh, notice that this approach uh, also works when server-side commands are included inside the routine. Another snag you might encounter occurs when you're creating or manipulating GUI objects inside a routine. So watch what happens if we also try to create a graphical window inside the routine. We get a different error message. SuperCollider says, we're not allowed to use this functionality and that we should try scheduling on app clock instead. Okay, what does this mean? In SuperCollider, there are three types of clocks, app clock, tempo clock, and system clock. System clock is a high priority clock, usually used for scheduling things that require great precision with respect to time. Tempo clock is similarly accurate. In fact, I, I think it might be equally accurate compared to system clock, but by design, it's more musical than system clock and thinks about time in terms of tempo, bars, beats, etc., in, instead of seconds. App clock is a low priority clock, and it's a good choice for scheduling things that don't need to happen at a precise moment in time. And in fact, app clock is the only clock that's allowed to schedule code that interacts with GUI, whether that code creates a GUI object or sets or gets the value of a GUI. By default, routines play using an instance of tempo clock, but we can change this by simply providing the name of a different clock as the first argument to the play method at the end of a routine. Even if we're not including GUI code in a routine, it's not really necessarily a bad idea to play the routine on app clock anyway. And I've actually gotten in the habit of doing this. This is especially true for code that's meant to just set everything up before a performance like we're doing in this video, where time accuracy isn't really an issue and you just want everything to happen in a particular order. So with that problem out of the way, let's get back to our synth def and synth example and uh, using routine, insert a one second wait time between the synth def and the synth. So this works. We hear sound about one second after evaluating the code. But this is definitely kind of a sketchy solution because well, the thing about asynchronous commands like this synthdef.add is that we don't really know exactly how long it's going to take. And in a lot of cases, we might have multiple synthdefs and the server might be doing other stuff at the moment. So from a practical point of view, what we'd like to do is wait just long enough 
for our asynchronous commands to finish. But no longer than that, because, you know, we got stuff to do. Let's get on with it. And this is where s.sync comes in. Instead of specifying a fixed wait time, s.sync waits only until the server completes all pending asynchronous commands. So once again, let's evaluate. And you should be able to hear that the time between evaluating and hearing sound is only as large as it needs to be, definitely less than one second. This approach with s.sync inside of a routine is reliable, but it does require that the server be already up and running. So this is where wait for boot comes in. And conveniently, if we use wait or sync without explicitly creating a routine inside wait for boot, then wait for boot creates a routine for us automatically. And I believe this auto-created routine is played on the app clock, which means we can freely include GUI code in our wait for boot function. So uh, once again, I'll evaluate this code. So what you see here is basically a shorter version of the wait for boot function uh, in our performance code, which we will now return to. After adding these three synth diffs, we'll do another s.sync to make sure that the server finishes before we continue. And it's here that we will finally take our functions, uh, make nodes and make events, and register them with server tree. And immediately after that, we'll do s.free all, which reinitializes the node tree and thereby causes server tree to evaluate these two registered functions. Uh, this defines our event dictionary, uh, enables MIDI functionality, and creates our initial node tree with two groups in one synth. One final s.sync, and then after that, we'll print done in the post window. And this is to let ourselves know that SuperCollider is done setting up and it is safe to begin a performance. And that is the essential structure for our performance environment. So at this point, uh, Although the environment won't do anything particularly interesting or musical, we should be able to evaluate the entire thing just to verify that the basic functionality is there. So uh, quit the server. Put the whole thing in parentheses so we can evaluate it all with one keystroke. Uh, cross your fingers and hit Command Enter. Okay, uh, I don't see any error messages, so that's a great start. And we can see that we're done in the post window. That's also good. Uh, let's first take a look at the node tree. And that looks perfect. We've got two groups with a reverb synth in the second group. So let's move on and check our buffers. So if we evaluate B, it looks like our dictionary has been properly filled. And so if we try to play a few buffers like this, Awesome, looks like that's working. So now I'm gonna watch the node tree and hit command period to make sure that server tree is actually reinstantiating our two groups and reverb synth. Perfect. Uh, tilde bus is a dictionary containing a single stereo audio bus, so that looks correct. And finally, let's route a synth through the reverb to make sure our signal chain is intact. So here's our BPF saw instrument with a low frequency, a long release, and we're gonna write that signal to the reverb bus uh, and place the synth in the main group. That sounds like reverb to me, so I think we are officially in good shape. The last thing we need to do is return to the function called make events and actually fill it with code that creates the sounds that we want for this composition. For better or worse, in the interest of keeping this video as short as possible, I've actually prepared this code in advance. So instead of typing it in at light speed, as is usually featured in these videos, I'm just gonna paste the events into our environment one by one and give brief descriptions as we go. Rest assured that everything in these event functions is stuff that's been previously featured in this tutorial series. So there are no weird tricks, no extra fancy patterns, just basic stuff. 
So what I encourage you to do if you want to digest the following event code more thoroughly is pause the video periodically and study the code at your own pace, maybe even copy it down for yourself and change some numbers around, or even experiment with making your own event functions once you get a sense of the basic approach that I'm using. The first event starts the piece by playing two P binds. The first pattern creates a sustained shaker texture in which the bandpass effect is active, and we randomly choose three high-pitched frequencies at which the shaker sounds resonate. The second pattern creates a sawtooth drone on MIDI note 26, the, the lowest D on the piano keyboard, and both of these P-binds generate synths indefinitely. So the next event, as we'll see in a second, will be responsible for stopping these patterns. Event one sounds like this. Event two also plays two P-binds, both of which also generate infinite length streams. The first generates a cloud of bell tones using this low C desk bell sample, but transposed down somewhere between five and a half and seven and a half semitones. And playback starts somewhere in the middle of the file, so we lose the characteristic attack transient of striking the bell. The second pattern creates a different sort of drone from our sawtooth instrument. In this case, the frequency of the oscillators are even lower, you know, between one and 25 hertz. So we get this irregular, bubbly sort of texture. In this case, I don't want to stop the previous two patterns immediately, so I enclose the code for this event in a routine in which we first start the two new patterns, wait four seconds, and then stop the patterns from event one. So here's what event two sounds like. Event 3 is similar to Event 2, but without the routine. First, we just stop the patterns from Event 2 and immediately play two new patterns. The first uh, is a lot like the bell cloud pattern, but the detune range is more narrow, and so we get a more clear sense of pitch. The second pattern uses our sawtooth instrument and is a simpler version of the marimba pattern from Tutorial 15. The main difference is that there are fewer delta times, fewer rhythmic values, and fewer resonant frequencies to choose from. Uh, speaking in terms of the big picture of this composition, events one and two are sort of less pitched and a little bit more chaotic, and event three is sort of a transition point where we're starting to move away from this chaos and toward uh, this sort of E major, B major language that we heard at the end of tutorial 15. In event three, we have pitches uh, C sharp, B, F sharp, C sharp, and B in the marimba, and a high B in the bell tone pattern. So it's more of an open fifth type of harmony that's uh, consistent with E major and B major. And uh, in event three, we're just getting a small taste of what will become a more complete diatonic collection. And here's how it sounds. In event four, first we stop the patterns from event three, and then finally we're ready to use the two patterns we developed in tutorial 15. So we'll just go find those and copy and paste them into our event function. And last, event 5 stops these two patterns, which ends the piece. We could stop here, but something I usually like to do is add a few additional event functions that stop themselves automatically and can therefore be sprinkled into the composition at will during performance. You can think of these as, quote, one-shot events, which is a term usually seen used in contrast with looped or sustained sounds, and one-shot samples just 
play from beginning to end once whenever you trigger them. So I think it makes sense to appropriate this terminology here. Our first one-shot event creates 12 sawtooth synths with a lot of randomization of parameters, but the fundamental frequencies are all pretty low, between 8 and 60 hertz, which gives us this sort of low animal growl kind of sound. It sounds like this. Here's one-shot event number two, which creates 15 synths using our shaker sound. The playback rate is chosen randomly from a fairly wide range, but BPF mix is set to zero, so there's no resonance and they sound fairly similar to the original sample. Our third and final one-shot event is a lot like one-shot number two, but here BPF mix is set to one, so these samples are processed by a bandpass filter and the filter's center frequencies are randomly chosen from an E major pitch collection. So this one-shot event uh, is going to harmonize nicely with the chords and marimba texture in event four. Okay, so if we quit the server and then run all of this code again. Now, uh, instead of having to evaluate these large sections of musical event code, we can just ask our dictionary, E, to do the work for us. Again, we could stop here, but if you have a MIDI controller handy, you could use it to trigger events instead of typing and evaluating code, if that's what you prefer. Uh, next to my computer, I've got my Korg Nano Control, which I'm going to plug in. And then uh, save this code file, and I quit and reopen Super Collider to make sure it actually sees this new device. Uh, generally, you want to connect your MIDI devices before launching Super Collider. And you can now see in the post window that SuperCollider has recognized the nano control. So now let's scroll to our empty MIDI diff and see if we can just get it to just post the MIDI data that the nano control is sending. Now keep in mind that I already know that this nano control sends continuous controller or CC messages, which is why I'm using .cc. Uh, if you have, let's say, a piano keyboard controller, you can actually use individual notes to trigger events by just replacing dot cc with dot note on. But uh, anyway, instead of nil, we'll declare two arguments, which are the controller value and controller number. And for now, we'll just post an array of these two values. Evaluate this MIDI def, and with an eye on the post window, we can see that the top row of buttons sends messages on controllers 73 through 81, with a value of 127 when pressed down and a value of zero when released. The bottom row picks up where the top row left off, sending on controller numbers 82 through 90. So let's use the top row of buttons for our primary musical events and the bottom row of buttons for the one-shot events. Inside the MIDI def function, I'm going to use a case statement, which is a handy tool for dealing with multiple conditional statements. A case statement consists of pairs of functions, a test function, which returns true or false, and a second function to be evaluated if the first function is true. Uh, if the first function is false, then case moves on to the next pair of functions. To play the first musical event, here's what we want in plain English. If we press the first button in the top row down, evaluate event one in our event dictionary. And in super collider lingo, it looks like this. If the received message came from controller 73 and the value of that controller is 127, evaluate the function at event1 in our dictionary E. 
To save some time, I'm just going to paste in the other seven function pairs, but you should be able to see at a glance that the logic is basically exactly the same as the first line. Okay, but what happens if we press a button that isn't one of these eight controllers? Well, who knows, right? And uh, what I usually do is provide one final safety case with true in the first function and nil in the second. So even if case passes through all eight of these functions and they're all false, true will always be true. And so if case gets to the end, it does nothing. And one last thing I'm going to do is just get rid of this val num post ln at the top of the MIDI def and instead put some post ln messages on the end of these evaluated functions. So when we trigger these events, uh, we'll also be printing information in the post window, which is actually fairly useful. It'll uh, help us keep our place in the piece so we don't like accidentally trigger event two twice in a row or something like that. And that's it. We are done with our performance environment. So for good measure, let's quit the server one last time, reevaluate everything. And at this point, I'm actually going to perform the piece. That's it for tutorial 17. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, you can download what you've seen here using the link in the video description below. And what you've seen in this video is what I'd consider to be a simplified and tutorial friendly version of a personal approach to composition and performance in SuperCloud. It's worked pretty well for me for several years and this approach is usually very accommodating if you find yourself trying to make changes to the piece during the compositional process. Uh, now, I'm not trying to push this as a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, and actually, in the Super Collider folder, there's a subfolder called Examples and then a folder called Pieces. And I can just about guarantee that every one of these files is going to look very different from my approach, which is part of why I like Super Collider so much. And you'll probably find some really interesting and illuminating things in this folder, so I definitely encourage you to check it out. Well, anyway, I hope you've been able to get something valuable out of this miniature three-part series, and please leave any comments or questions below. If you've been enjoying these tutorials, I hope you'll consider giving a thumbs up or sharing the video. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.